Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody to our the beginning of our six part series, uh, Enslavement and Resistance, New England, 1620 to 1760. I'm really delighted to see so many people joining us. We have never had so many people sign up. We had over 500 people sign up. And even though it's a free event, a lot of people don't turn up, it's online. It's just, you've all knocked it out, out of the park. It's unbelievable. It's really great. We've never had so many people, so excellent. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, the Partnership of Historic Boston's is a small public history nonprofit. We're devoted to 17th century New England, to telling the stories of all the people in New England and to forebears in England and elsewhere in Europe as well. Um, we think that the 17th century is the most exciting century going. And <laughs> that is admittedly a niche interest, but if you share this sentiment, we think it's the foundation for what follows in the United States or to be the United States. If you're interested, we're always looking for volunteers, so get in touch. Um, I wanna say a couple of words about this series because it goes on until the 6th of December and then some nuts and bolts and then introduce our speaker, Jared Hardesty. So just a couple of things. We chose this topic, the topic of slavery and resistance this year in part because it's so contentious. As you know, from you know everything from the Florida school curriculum and claiming that slaves benefited because they learned skills to the debate over the 1619 project. And here in New England, you know, the kind of culture wars have not reached this fever pitch, but we did believe that it was important to have a kind of a rigorous and open-minded airing of the different understandings of enslavement in New England, because there are a lot of myths that New England was a free region that's that you know, wasn't important, that uh, it happened in the South, et cetera. So we wanted to, to go to the absolute experts and we have them. We have five amazing, amazing historians and tribal representatives and a great tour of the last remaining, um, the last standing slave quarters in New England with the, in the Royal House. So we started because we wanted to have that open-minded discussion and the airing of information. And the second reason we chose slavery is because, as I just mentioned, it's not very well known that slavery is important here. It was kind of a was kind of an overlooked facet of New England history. And it was a minimized facet of American history. And, and we believe that you cannot have an accurate view of the past unless you include this story. So and some people find it difficult. We just think it's important to have that accuracy in our view of the past and in part because it helps illuminate the present. So those were our motivations. Um, I want to say that this is a series. Jared is opening it and giving us the overview of how slavery in New England fit into the European context, into the context of different degrees of unfreedom in labor practices and and how slavery helped to build New England colonies and their wealth and privilege and power. That's an overview. But then with the next one on the 1st of November, which is uh, about the Pequot War, we go back to the beginning of slavery, to where um, the Pequot War was waged in part to capture Native people and to enslave them because of the crisis in the labor market. So. So we hope that you stay with us for the whole series. Um, uh, I'm a professor of history at Western Washington University, so I'm coming uh, to you from the West Coast. Uh, so it's still the afternoon here. Um, and my job uh, as part of the speaker series is to kind of introduce this uh, this topic and provide a context, as, as Sarah was explaining, uh, kind of a context for understanding slavery in early New England um, and its relationship to the colonization of the region. So I, I'm going to do kind of a, a big picture uh, talk to uh, this evening or this afternoon. Um, and I hope to kind of challenge the way we think about slavery in New England. Um, I want us to think about slavery as kind of um, not so much at the margins of the history of New England, but at, at its absolute kind of center of its settlement and development in the colonial era. 
And I want us to kind of step away from the the sort of exceptionalism that we oftentimes think about New England, uh, especially slavery in New England as being exceptional, right? That there's this myth that slavery didn't exist here. Uh, I think we finally overcome that myth uh, through the work of, of, of the dogged work of scholars and uh, public historians and activists. We finally kind of overcome that myth. But there still are these myths about it not being important, um, it not, not being particularly relevant or something like that. So I want to really put New England in the con a wider context, a wider sort of context of colonization across the Americas, and especially the English colonization of the Americas, uh, to understand uh, th this. Um, and what I want us to keep in mind is kind of two things. The, the first is that the choice to enslave in New England, the choice to use slavery in New England was both um, intentional and aspirational, uh, intentional and aspirational. Um, it's something that people aspire to, to, to find a solution to their labor problems. Um, and the second, there is exceptionalism. And, and, I, and I'll, that's where I'm going to end the talk uh, this evening is to address a little bit of how New England's unique. And it's unique because of the just absolutely incredible records we have to understand the history of slavery and the lives of enslaved people. So I'm going to go ahead here and share my screen. Um, I have a PowerPoint for us this evening. Um, and here you can see uh, the uh, the title of my talk. I probably should have brought this up a couple minutes ago, but uh, here we are. So um, as part of introducing myself uh, as well, I just wanted to make note that uh, I, I am the author of three books about the history of, of slavery in New England. Uh, my first book called Unfreedom, um, which is about slavery in 18th century Boston. So I'm a little... Uh, a little late uh, for for historic Boston's uh, in, in my research, um, Sarah and I could debate what's the better century. Century. Um, I'm an 18th century historian uh, by training. Um, uh, my second book, though, is uh, Black Lives, Native Lands, White Worlds. They're right in the middle, um, and it is a, a general history and overview of slavery in New England. And it's this book that really required me to go back in time and to really sort of get at origins and where slavery came from how it kind of was part of this larger um, English colonization of the Americas, how this all fit and how slavery and colonization happened at the same time. Um, and so that's kind of where, uh, that's where a lot of this research for the talk tonight is coming from. Um, but I also wrote this book, uh, came out uh, now two years ago, actually two years ago today, actually, I think, um, Mutiny on the Rising Sun, um, which is a, a history about a, a mute, obviously a mutiny. Um, and an international smuggling ring uh, that this mutiny kind of uh, highlights um, in the it's an 18th century history. But one of the things about writing that book that it really brought home and I'm going to emphasize throughout the talk today is that this deep connection that New England has or had to the slave societies of the of the West Indies uh, of the Caribbean um, and how integral that is to understanding the history of slavery in New England. And so I'm going to come back to that later. But the the writing that book just really brought that home in a, in a real way. Um, so we're going to talk about three things to, this evening. Uh, we're going to talk about the origins of slavery, uh, very broad. Uh, I want to go back to biblical times uh, very briefly, I promise. Um, I feel like the, my students, when they start an essay, from the beginning of time. Um, but uh, but I'm not going to do that. But I will have to do some highlights throughout history. Um, then we'll talk about slavery in early New England. That's kind of where I'll focus a lot of my time. Um, and then finally, I'm going to end by talking about, give a couple uh, stories of enslaved lives in early New England, talk about the sources we have that allow us to do this research. Um, then I, I do, I do, will save time for questions. Uh, so please uh, save your questions. Um, and I'm, I'll be very, very happy to answer those and, and hopefully have a good conversation after the talk. Um, I taught two classes today, so I, I might have a, not have a voice, but I will try to answer your questions. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about the origins of, of, of slavery um, in, in the English-speaking world, I guess is kind of where uh, I'll, I'll, I'll focus here. Um, there's a long history of slavery um, in, in the European world, in the European context, in the West, what we call, used to call the Western tradition. Um, we have to remember that the ancient societies of Greece, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, these were slave societies. Um, at certain points in the history of the Roman Empire, you know, something like two thirds of the population is enslaved. Um, it, so history, has, uh, slavery has a very deep history in the Western world. And given throughout his throughout, you know, the, the Middle Ages into the early modern period, the period we're talking about today, 
this constant sort of desire, this reference to antiquity, wanting to go look to antiquity for inspiration, look for the classics, look for all of that. Um, of course, not only do they encounter, you know, uh, great works of poetry and literature uh, and plays, uh, they also encounter slavery. Um, and this is most important in the law, where uh, especially continental Europeans, uh, but but to a lesser extent, English uh, speakers, uh, they go back to ancient Roman law codes, and there's the law of slavery. Um, and this is something that's re replicated throughout um, uh, the, the, um, the throughout throughout this time. Um, you also, of course, have, have the Bible, um, which is a source of, of slavery. Um, depending on how you read the Bible, is it could be this uh, radically anti-slavery document. You know, the book of Exodus is a, is a slave rebellion, after all. Um, but also, it does provide quite a bit of uh, pro-slavery messaging. Um, the book of Leviticus, for example, has laws about governing uh, enslaved people. Um, but the New Testament as well, if we think about Paul on the road to Damascus, um, encountering Onesimus, a runaway slave, and telling Onesimus to return to his master um, uh, and saying that we have to obey our earthly masters. So there's this sort of, um, this kind of pro-slavery message in the Bible that also is ingrained in the, in the Western tradition. So that's a kind of longer history. But by the end of the, the Middle Ages, by the end of the medieval period, um, in Northern Europe, especially so in England, uh, the Netherlands, Northern France, slavery has by and large disappeared. Um, and that said, though, as much as slavery's disappeared, uh, first of all, it's still in a lot of law, continental European law codes, uh, but also other forms of bound labor have not, um, kind of what I would call unfreedom. These sorts of, and I'll, I'll give you a definition here in a minute, but these sorts of various forms of of, of bound labor, bound labor that that are used uh, to to produce, um, and these could be anything from like serfdom, um, common in, in say France, uh, or uh, something like apprenticeship, um, uh, domestic servitude. Um, and that's what you see here in the, in the picture. This is a Dutch Golden Age painting, um, and, and Dutch Golden Age paintings are full of this this form of unfreedom, which is servitude. You see the domestic servant uh, beside uh, in the, in her, her mistress kind of pointing out after she broke some dishes. Um, and, and so this, so while Northern Europeans, like English people, uh, Dutch people do not have slavery, they still have all these other forms of, of bondage. And, and in fact, if you take a look in early New England at the laws that are governing enslaved people, or they're used to govern enslaved people, they're oftentimes the same laws that are used to govern servants, uh, indentured servants, um, apprentices, and, and things like that. Um, and so this is really important, uh, th this sort of, tr this kind of continuing uh, forms of, of labor dependence. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, the other thing, though, is that when the English become interested in colonizing the Americas because the Spanish and the Portuguese did it first, uh, they learn about the riches of the Americas from the Spanish and to a lesser extent the Portuguese. They they also recoil at the horrors of the Spanish colonization of the Americas. They, they read Las Casas. They read these accounts. Um, and, and so... They, they're watching the Spanish colonize the Americas. Um, by the mid 16th century, there's English people traveling to the Caribbean, traveling all over the Atlantic. And what they encounter when they go out in the Atlantic is slavery. Uh, they encounter uh, you know, uh, Spanish societies in the Americas, Portuguese colonies in Brazil. They go to West Africa. And everywhere they go, they encounter slavery. And this is the moment that, that sort of as English people are going abroad, they're coming home, they're writing about it, they're talking about it, because everywhere they went uh, in this time period, they encountered slavery. And in this, what this does is in the English mind, links <laughs> slavery with colonization, that uh, to have a successful colony, uh, you use slavery. Um, and and when they go to emulate the Spanish uh, or the Portuguese, that's that's in the mind. Um, and so the idea that African slavery was somehow alien to English people when they come to New England, when the Puritans arrive, it, it's not. They would have been deeply familiar with it from reading travel logs, from from all the sorts of hearing stories told on docks and in taverns about the Americas. They would have been familiar with 
slavery, the use of African slaves, the use of indigenous slaves. Uh, this would have all been very familiar to them um, and not really alien at all. Um, so as I said, you're going to hear me use this term unfreedom quite a bit. Um, so I want to give a quick working definition. Uh, I'll be using it a few more times throughout the talk tonight. Um, and also to give us a, another kind of important context um, for understanding what's going to happen in New England. Um, the, the definition here is the varying degrees of legal and customary dependence meant to extract labor and create social hierarchy. Um, and the important thing to remember that most people who live in these uh, societies and in the Americas or in, even in Europe are in some ways unfree. Children are unfree. Um, wives are unfree. They're under the, the guise of their husbands. Um, but also apprentices, servants, enslaved people. Um, they all fall into this kind of category of unfree. And so if you'd survey the landscape of a, of a, of a say, a New England town in the 17th century, unfreedom would characterize it more than freedom would, uh, because most people are in some ways legally dependent upon uh, a, a man, a patriarch usually, um, as either a child, a wife, or a, a, some sort of bound independent laborer. And so when we think about American society, New England society before 1800, it's really unfreedom that's, that characterizes it. The, the number, uh, when I first learned this number in graduate school, um, it really surprised me is that it's something like 80% of migrants to what became the United States. So before the, who arrived in the, what became the United States before the American Revolution arrived in some state of unfreedom and some state of dependence. Um, so we're talking about the vast majority of people. And the other thing is for most, say, children born in New England, they pass through a period of unfreedom in their in their lives. Uh, they go through a period of farm servitude or an apprenticeship or something like that. And that, and so it's normal, it's natural. And so the idea of holding another in bondage, of extracting labor from another, from exploiting another, is deeply ingrained because that's the kind of way the world works. Um, and so it's a really important context for us to keep in mind as we talk about, well, why do they settle on using slavery? Why do they settle on, you know, it's it's this reason is, is why. It, it makes sense. It's kind of second nature uh, in a lot of ways. And they've encountered it everywhere. It's something that's very common So in, in this world. So that's a kind of big context to talk about. Um, let's talk, let's get to brass tacks. Let's talk about the slavery in New England um, in the settlement uh, of New England. And Sarah alluded this in her in her introduction. Um, she didn't give it all away, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on it there. Um, so uh, obviously uh, you all know that uh, uh, Europeans, English people began arriving in New England um, and settling in 1620. Um, uh, the Plymouth Colony of uh, 1626, and then, you know, there's subsequent waves of of, of migrants um, in the Massachusetts Bay Company, uh, something like 30,000 all told by 1640 uh, Puritans, uh, very unique migration, um, and that it's uh, family units that are that are moving over. The early New England economy from in the 1630s is booming. Um, because there's all of these migrants arriving. Um, and there's been some really wonderful work on this. Carla Pastana's book about Plymouth is really wonderful about um, the Plymouth settlers really benefited from the arrival of all these Puritans uh, in the 16, late 1620s and 1630s uh, because they raised so much livestock that then the Puritans come, they want to buy livestock and they can buy them for Plymouth. Um, and so the, this mass migration of Puritans into the region creates this real bustling economy, essentially farm building economy um, of, of people who need tools, they need food, they need livestock to, to build farms and to build towns. The thing is, though, that this really papered over the fact that there's not much else of an economy in the region besides helping new settlers settle. Um, there's really no export markets. Uh, there's some fishing, some timbering. Uh, but beyond that, there's not a whole lot uh, of economic activity beyond accommodating new settlers, um, which is a problem come 1640 when the settlers stop coming. Settlers stop coming uh, for a whole host of reasons, uh, civil war and political reasons. Um, and this 
leads to a collapse uh, of the economy. Essentially, the economy just kind of halts. Uh, no new settlers. There wasn't. They had not built out markets for all the farm produce. Their their the the stuff they're making on their farms. The other thing that happened was at this exact same moment, um, the English Puritans did bring quite a few indentured servants with them, and those servants' contracts expire about 1640. Um, so you have all these servants becoming free. Uh, there's not much economic activity uh, beyond farm building and helping others build farms. And, and now they're short of labor. They have no markets. And so you have a kind of a collapse, uh, or essentially, maybe not collapse, but a grinding to a halt of the economy. Um, and when the economy grinds to, grinds to a halt, it raises the question, of what do we do? Because they have enough to feed themselves. The, the farms are fairly productive, um, but that's not helpful for getting things they don't produce, um, for making money um, beyond just a little bit of, of, of farm work. And so New Englanders begin to sort of invest uh, heavily into trade and exploring trade networks beyond trading with the mother country, trading with other uh, colonies in the Americas, um, looking for a solution. They, they, they take the things they do have, which is lots of agricultural produce, uh, corn and apples and salt beef and salt pork. They take their salt fish. Uh, they take their timber, both to build ships and to sell. Um, and they, they begin to build a, uh, um, the, this kind of trade system um, where, and what they realize is that they can actually carry things cheaper. Um, and so that will allow them to make money. So they can go someplace and buy something expensive, uh, take it to England or sell it and bring and essentially profit. Um, this is called the carrying trade. Now, what that trade is though, however, um, and, and what the majority of that trade is, uh, is part of the other solution to this, this question, which was labor. Where does labor come from? And so by the, by the mid 1630s, and especially after 1640, you start to see the sort of settlement of slavery as a solution to this economic problem. Um, the, the major sort of way in which slavery is a solution is, is what historians call the business of slavery, the, the business of slavery. Um, essentially, what the business of slavery is, is, is all of the sorts of, so slavery is not just the, the use of enslaved labor to produce um, in a colony, uh, to produce things. It's also the use, uh, it's also everything that sustains a system of slavery. So providing food, uh, shipping the goods that enslaved people produce, uh, the goods and commodities that enslaved people produce, trading in captives. Um, and New Englanders invest heavily in the business of slavery, in trading, um, and taking the things that they produce, salt cod, lumber, agricultural products, and using those to provision slave societies in the Americas, especially in the Caribbean. And I'm going to come back to this, this Caribbean connection. Um, they also sell a lot of slave-made products, uh, whether that is... Um, in the form of sugar and molasses and rum or cotton and other things produced in the Caribbean uh, or tobacco that's produced in Virginia and Maryland. And of course, they uh, get involved in the slave trade. And so this is the, the document you see here over, over here. Um, it is the a 1671 trade agreement uh, between a Boston merchant by the name of Richard Wharton and a Maryland planter. And the, the, the agreements, uh, it's on both sides of the document. Um, it's kind of a long business agreement. Um, but what the agreement was that Wharton, the Boston merchant, uh, would go to the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, he would purchase enslaved Africans. He would bring those enslaved Africans back to Maryland for the planter, whose last name is uh, Cyborg. Cy no, sorry, Cyborg, sorry. Uh, got, got confused there. Uh, Cy Cyborg. Um, and is sell them to the planter um, in exchange for tobacco. So here we have uh, the Boston merchant going to the Caribbean, purchasing enslaved people, probably exchanging those enslaved people for provisions such as uh, salt cod or, or something like that, taking them back to taking them to Maryland to be exchanged for tobacco, which is also being produced using slave labor. So they ingratiate themselves into this sort of slave system in 
um, that's that's emerging in both the English col across the Atlantic, both in English and non English colonies, um, New England trade extensively in non English colonies as well. Um, the other way in which slavery becomes seen as a solution to this this economic problem is through the use of of labor uh, of of enslaved labor, um, the use of native people um, and uh, the use of, of Africans. And so what I want to do now is to to kind of talk about some of these themes a little more in depth about this decision to use use slavery uh, and use enslaved labor to, to, to invest in the business of slavery. Um, and one way to do that is to talk about the sort of uh, this idea of, of war and captivity. Um, I know Margaret Newell is part of this speaker series and she'll do a far better job uh, with this topic than I, I am. I can. Um, but New Englanders do use uh, indigenous uh, slave labor. They they capture and enslave local indigenous people in the region following, say, the Pequot War, which Sarah said, you know, your next talk is, is going to be about the Pequot War, um, to King Philip's War, uh, at least 2,000 captives uh, from King Philip's War. And the decision to do this um, was predicated upon a, a few things. The, the first was uh, that war against Native people uh, in the sort of biblical mindset of of puritans was considered just war because it was war against non-christians and under the those the laws of just war is that war captives can or people captured in war can be enslaved and so as you know new england hits these, these labor shortages in the late 1630s early 1640s as new england the economy starts to grind to a halt in the same time period um you see the rise of of captivity of of native people of of waging war and capturing them and that starts in the Pequot war in, in the six, uh, 16 from 1636 to 1638 um and so the question is why why indigenous slavery well the first one is that enslaved natives provide labor for the colonists uh so they can be put to work in households on farms um some indigenous captives uh were used as like messengers and things like that but the there's kind of two other reasons why New Englanders decided to enslave Native people. Um, they are a supplementary labor force in the colony, uh, or in the New England colonies. Um, but one reason was to alienate in, uh, people from their land. What better way to sort of uh, remove Native people from their land to actually hold them in bondage, legally speaking, uh, whether in New England itself or uh, perhaps sell them out of the colony, thus permanently kind of alienating them from their native land and creating space for the expansion of of the colonies. And this willingness, this willingness to uh, trade in um, uh, in in native people um, also meant that native captives were a commodity to sell. Uh, to to sell out into the Caribbean. And we can see this logic at work. There's a letter from Emmanuel Downing, uh, who was John Winthrop's brother-in-law, to, to John Winthrop um, in 1640, uh, 1643, where he essentially writes John, his brother-in-law, and says, the, I've heard the Narragansett, the, the people who lived in Rhode, who live in Rhode Island, uh, I heard the Narragansett are, are causing trouble. What if we start a war with them? Then we could the captives of that war we could take and sell them in the caribbean in exchange for africans uh to to trade um captives with with uh, with africans um and what what permits this uh to to happen and where emmanuel downing got that idea actually came uh because of a puritan colony uh i don't think uh, gets enough attention uh but there was another puritan colony um, and that is a colony of what's called Providence Island. So as you can see here, it's this very tiny, tiny little island in the Caribbean that's uh, all very close to the coast of Nicaragua, near in near Central America. It's settled by Puritans. And it's, you see here, the, the Journal of the Governor. It, the vision behind the Providence Island colony, it's settled at the same time as New England, so 1630s. The vision behind this originally was to be a base to raid and attack the Spanish, to steal silver, essentially pirates, uh, to be pirates. Um, 
over very quickly though, the Puritans that settle there realize that the land is really good for growing tobacco. And as the colony, the colony develops, it, it, there's a few hundred settlers there. Um, they also begin to use enslaved African labor to purchase or to, to grow tobacco. Uh, so very quickly, uh, within a few years, they're using enslaved African labor to grow tobacco on Providence Island and serve as a base. Now, as you can imagine, the Spanish were not particularly excited <laughs> about having this colony there. Um, so the, the Spanish will will destroy this colony in the early 1640s. Uh, but while it existed in the in the 1630s, um, it's this important space for New England. Um, because this is the the place, a, another Puritan colony, where uh, they learn this practice of trading native captives for African captives. Um, after the Pequot War, um, a number of captives are sent in 1638 um, from Boston uh, on board this ship called the Desire to Providence Island. Um, and those captives are on Providence Island exchanged for enslaved Africans. Um, because of Providence Island's purpose, right, as a, as a base of privateers, all sorts of Dutch and English uh, pirates and privateers showed up there to do business. Um, many of those privateers had raided uh, Portuguese slave ships headed to Brazil, and they would then sell those captives in on Providence Island. So New Englanders knew they could go there to acquire enslaved Africans. Um, and so by the late 1630s, um, you see uh, all this discussion, uh, say in John Winthrop's journal and in letters about the potential of the Caribbean, the or, uh, of Providence Island and other West Indian islands as a market, a market for all the stuff that New Englanders are producing and a source to buy captives, uh, to buy Africans or to sell indigenous captives uh, by the late 1630s. Um, this is, this, is, uh, this is happening. You, you kind of see it. Uh, in, in the writing there. Um, meanwhile, just to finish the story of the of the desire, the 1638 voyage, uh, which goes to Providence Island, purchases Africans and then sails back to Boston, um, which then they bring some of the first African captives to uh, to New England was in exchange for Pequot captives uh, from from the Pequot War. And so this cycle, uh, this is the way in which slavery and colonization is deeply linked in early New England is this exchange of indigenous captives for African captives. Um, so it's it starts very early, 1638. Uh, you, you see it happening. So Providence Island taught, even though it's, it's captured by the Spanish and the Puritans are, are kicked out, um, Providence Island does teach the New Englanders that there's a lot of potential in the Caribbean. And in the years following this moment, uh, they invest heavily in Caribbean trade. Um, they invest heavily in trade with the Caribbean. Uh, most significantly is this little island here, the island of Barbados, uh, first settled by the English in 1625. Um, it's the, it, it rapidly, by the mid-1640s, develops into a major producer of sugarcane. Um, and sugarcane is like producing producing sugar in this time period is like producing white gold. It is so valuable um, that uh, that that it very quickly this little island is very wealthy, producing lots of sugar. And to produce that sugar, they use enslaved African labor, increasingly uh, in, in, an enslaved African labor force. Um, you can see that here, working the mill. Uh, this is a 17th century image of the of a. I think it's a French plantation, but these guys they kind of look like Puritans, so I use the image there um, of using uh, of using enslaved African labor to grow sugarcane on the island. It's very very profitable. Um, by 1660, enslaved Africans actually outnumber uh, English settlers on Barbados. Uh, by about by 1700, they outnumber uh, uh, white white colonists about seven to one or so. So it's a huge uh, enslaved African population, small white population producing sugar. Now, this is a small island. Um, and very quickly, every plantable acre of land on this little island is it's it's clear cut and it's planted with sugar cane. What that means is that they need food. They need livestock. They need timber all the stuff that the New England colonies produce. Um, 
all the stuff the New England counties produce. And so Barbados becomes a major export market. As New Englanders are out in the world looking for trade, they find Barbados, where they can take the stuff that they produce, which is has value, but it's not expensive, fancy stuff. They take it to the Caribbean, and there they can exchange it for very valuable sugar and molasses and rum and and all and cotton and all sorts of other stuff. And Barbados is one of many Caribbean islands where New Englanders are going to start doing business. It's estimated that by 1700, uh, trade with the West Indies uh, comprises about two thirds of all of, of the New England colonies overseas trade. So this is a significant market. Um, New Englanders are sustaining slavery, uh, essentially. They're sustaining these plantations that grow sugar, uh, that grow, you know, that they, they're sustaining that. Uh, they're, they're feeding enslaved people. They're providing the wood, the livestock, everything that's necessary for maintaining these, these plantations. And it's a two-way street. Um, this is the other important part of the Caribbean connections, is it, it's, a, it's a two-way street between the Caribbean and New England, um, because this is where New Englanders really encounter slavery, uh, plantation slavery. This is where they learn about slavery is there. And so there's this uh, one of the uh, fascinating things in, in my research uh, on New England slavery I found is that um, in New England, uh, they don't have a they, there's never a or, or I'm sorry, Massachusetts, there's never a comprehensive slave code passed like Barbados and Virginia. They pass these you know laws about slavery that comprise a slave code um, that doesn't happen in Massachusetts. Um, and rather, what it seems is that in Massachusetts, they rely upon a, a series of, of laws, um, one of which I'll talk about here in just a second. Um, but they rely upon a series of laws about servant law, a law that legalized slavery, and but really they treat a lot of uh, the laws around slavery as merely customary. So the the idea that children follow the status of the mother that is customary and you know, it's never written down. It's just practiced in uh, in the New England colonies, and that's learned in Barbados. They they go to Barbados, they see it in action, and then they just kind of copy that custom and don't ever put it into the law books. Uh, it just it just comes and it becomes commonplace for them. That said, um, as as much as slavery was treated as customary, or they use servant law or something to govern slavery day to day, it is important to remember uh, that Massachusetts was one of the first colonies, uh, the, what, the first English colony in North America to legalize slavery. And they do that in the 1641 law code called the Body of Liberties. Um, and so when we're thinking about the way New Englanders respond to that uh, economic crisis of the uh, of the late 1630s, early 1640s, one of those responses is creating a law that allows them to practice slavery, uh, to find captive laborers um, uh, and, and, and use captive laborers. And so the law reads very strangely. I'm sure many of you are already reading it. Um, it actually starts off that it says that there shall never be any bond slavery, villainage, or captivity among us. So on its surface, this law is like anti-slavery, banning slavery. But then there's the unless. Um, and these, the what comes after the unless really gets us into the mindset of early Massachusetts settlers and their attitudes towards slavery. Um, unless it be lawful captives taken in just wars. That's referring to indigenous people. As such uh, strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. Uh, that's, uh, that's Africans um, being sold. And then they kind of go on to how uh, enslaved people can be used uh, in there and like they they're all use biblical uh precedents essentially to to govern uh slavery so this law first in english america to legalize slavery outright um it tells it it gets us right in the mindset about slavery and, and, and the utility of slavery in this moment right it's about capturing indigenous people uh, either to enslave them and put them to work to alienate them from their land or to sell them um, and of course, to acquire uh, enslaved Africans. So before I go into the the kind of last uh, part of the talk about enslaved people, I want to dwell very briefly on um, what where my thoughts are. Uh, my when I collected my thoughts for this talk and kind of where my thoughts are 
in comparison to say Virginia. So this is an artistic uh, image of the of the of 1619 in Virginia, the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to what became the United States, that date that's got so much attention. Um, and for me, I, I want to I really think that what's happening in Virginia in the 17th century is very similar to what's happening in New England. Um, and we, we think, but in our own minds, we tend to separate them. We, we tend to think about New England as being, you know, one thing, a place where it became fr a free state eventually in Virginia, you know, became a slave state. Uh, but in the 17th century, in this early moment, they're very similar. Um, they have comparable enslaved populations, say in the mid 17th century. So there's a probably about 250 to 400 enslaved people in Virginia in 1650 and probably a comparable number um, in New England. Um, numbers are kind of hard to get at. Um, and the slow process of adopting slavery, of writing it into the law, it's very similar, once again, in, in both places, because they come out of that same English tradition where they've gone out into the world and they've, they've learned about slavery. They see its utility for colonization. It's something that's uh, intentional and aspirational, like I said at the beginning of the talk. So it's very similar in, in both places. The divergence is only going to happen later. Uh, it's only going to happen later, and it's only going to happen because of the, the, the specific need for labor in both places. So in Virginia, they grow tobacco. They need lots of labor for tobacco. Um, and so they settle on using large enslaved labor forces uh, on plantations in, in the eastern uh, tidewater, the, the Chesapeake. In New England, um, over time, they come to see there's, there's not as much capital in rural areas of New England, not as much wealth. But you do see the emergence of quite a few, uh, you, quite extensive use of slavery in urban areas in New England. Places like Boston or Newport, Rhode Island or New London or Salem, you see the extensive use of, of slavery there. Um, it's oftentimes written that, you know, in New England, they don't have a cash crop that made slavery valuable. And that's true. Uh, you know, they don't have tobacco. They don't have sugar in New England. But the economic need is different from the mentalities that people had, right? Just because the economic need is not there does not mean the mentality of owning enslaved people was not there. And so just like uh, just like in Virginia, by the end of the 17th century, slavery is ingrained in the everyday life of, of the New England colonies. It just looks different, right? Uh, slavery is concentrated in urban areas, not big plantations in rural areas. Um, but slavery is where the, the, where the wealth is in this case. Um, and my favorite image, which is from the 18th century, but I have to share it every public talk I give, is this needlepoint over here uh, by a woman named Prudence Punderson. You can see her initials on the coffin. Um, and is made sometime in the early 1770s, we think, in Connecticut. Um, and we can see the enslaved woman uh, in the needlepoint that she actually stitched into the needlepoint. And, and to have slavery show up in such a kind of piece of, you know, local vernacular art, uh, New England needlepoint, really in this rural area in Connecticut really tells us the way in which slavery is ingrained in in kind of New England life uh, by the the end of the, the colonial period. Um, and it's it might look different than it does in Virginia, but that mentality about slavery and its utility, it's it's very similar. And it comes out of this moment in the 17th century when colonists are trying to figure out, you know, what's going on um, and, and how to use slavery and how the benefits of slavery for colonization. So in that sense, you know, New England's part of a larger English colonization of the Americas uh, that, you know, the, the English people are wrestling with this question of, of slavery and how to use slave labor where to use slave labor. And so we see it popping up everywhere, Virginia, New England, we popping up in the royal court. So this is a woman, she was uh, a, a courtier in Charles II's court. And you see has an enslaved African, uh, sir, a, a child serving uh, her. Here in this image, this is uh, a depiction of Quakers, Quakers who later became anti-slavery, the first anti-slavery folks. But in the 17th century, this is the depiction of a Quaker family in Barbados, using enslaved labor on their tobacco farm. So everywhere in the English-speaking world in the 17th century, there's this sort of kind of working out 
how to use slavery to make colonization, to make empire work. Um, and so New England should be considered kind of part and parcel of that of that movement. Um, and so I, I, this is, like I said, the, the point today is to kind of get us out of that mindset of a, a New England exceptionalism and understand it as part of a wider mo movement of, of kind of colonization. So finally, uh, I want to talk about enslaved lives. I want to talk about the lives of enslaved people, because the one thing that does make New England uh, exceptional are the records. Puritans love to write. They're so self-reflective. They keep their diaries. They write their letters. Um, and they preserve this stuff. Um, and this is good for us. So they, they keep meticulous, comprehensive public and private records. And so we see here, this does not mention slavery, but it's a, a page of uh, Samuel Sewell's diary. Sewell uh, keeps a diary, uh, you know, from the 1670s through the time of his death. Um, and he writes about slavery and about enslaved people he encounters. He writes about uh, an, a slave man that he freed, whose name was Boston, who lived in his household. This shows up in these private writings. So we can kind of understand this, this life. Church records, we have baptismal records, uh, things like that of, of enslaved people. Um, the, the New England uh, Hidden History Project from the Congregational Archives has done just an amazing job of uncovering uh, the presence of enslaved people in early congregational churches uh, in the 17th and 18th century. Um, their presence, they're there, they're recorded, it's noted. Um, they make confessions to become full church members um, in the 17th and 18th centuries. We also have numerous travelers writing about their experiences in New England and encountering enslaved people uh, in, in New England. Um, and so when combined, all of these records allow us to better understand slavery and the lives of enslaved people. Um, so just to give us a couple more sense of, of types of records that are available um, over here, this is a court record from Plymouth uh, from 1653, where uh, we see a, a, a servant of, uh, uh, of John Barnes and a slave a servant of John Barnes um, who's involved in a business transaction that, that's gone awry, um, essentially, uh, in this trans, uh, this record. Uh, the other really uh, important set of sources we have are probate records. So wills, probate inventories, and things like that, which once you can start from the, the moment uh, the, the Puritans arrive, uh, they start keeping these types of records. And so this is a, a, um, a probate inventory here from the 1650s, and you see... Uh, two uh, Negro and a child Negro. So three en uh, enslaved people uh, in this inventory showing up. It's Robert Keene's inventory, by the way. Um, so let's talk about a couple of these stories, what we can extrapolate using the these really great records that are available to us. And then what using the context uh, that other like historians have, have, have been able to to kind of add to this uh, using additional records, we can kind of flesh out a couple stories. And so one of my uh, favorite stories, it comes from John Jocelyn's account of New England. It's published 1674, but it comes based on John Jocelyn's two trips through New England. Um, one in uh, the 16, 1638 uh, and the other, I think, believe in the 1660s. Um, he travels twice through and he kind of keeps up on the history of New England and stuff like that. And during his first uh, voyage uh, in, in, the six, in 1638, he, he writes about this. He goes to Samuel Maverick's farm on, on Noddle Island in, in Boston Harbor, uh, which is where the airport is today. Um, and he talks about this uh, woman came to his chamber window in her own country language and tune sang very loud and shrill going out to her she used a great deal of respect towards me and willingly would have expressed her grief in English by apprehended by her countenance and deportment whereupon I uh, repaired to my host to learn of him the cause so he goes to uh, uh, Maverick and asks what why was she upset and uh, Maverick later tells him that uh, she had been a queen in her own country and observed a very humble and dutiful garb used towards her by another uh, enslaved woman in the household who actually acted as her maid. So we have an enslaved woman who has a woman waiting on her. Um, Mr. Maverick was desirous to have a breed of Negroes, and therefore, seeing she would not yield by persuasions to company with a Negro young man he had in his house, he commanded him, willed she nilled, she go to bed with her, which no sooner done, but kicked him out again, and thus took in high disdain beyond her slavery, and this was the cause of her grief. It's a half paragraph, where essentially Jocelyn describes the rape of this enslaved woman, because Samuel Maverick wants to increase his uh his the number of enslaved people he he has 
based on research into this case and who she was and or po potentially who she was um, and when she arrived in New England, um, historians have been able to discern that she's probably from um, Angola or the kingdom of the Congo in West Central Africa. And you see here, this is actually a 20th century artistic rendition of, of, of Africans from this region. But what we know is that this region is uh, embroiled in civil wars uh, in the 1620s and 1630s. And women would oftentimes accompany their husbands in the battle. They kind of follow the warriors in the battle. And she was probably um, a noble woman, thus the maid waiting on her, who was captured uh, along with her husband um, by the Portu by, by uh, a rival African kingdom um, and put into, sold to, to the Portuguese uh, as a slave and, and probably then the ship she was on probably captured by a Dutch or English privateer. And she ultimately ended up in New England and was purchased by Samuel, Ma uh, or Samuel Maverick. Potentially, she was on the desire. Uh, the dates don't quite line up, but that, that is a possibility there. So using what we know about early 17th century West Central Africa and other records of enslaved people in New England from this time, which suggest they're from this part of Africa, what we know about English privateering and that relationship to New England and John Jocelyn's account, we can try to figure out this woman whose name's never given. We can kind of try to, we can actually kind of flesh out her life story. My final example here is a little bit shorter, um, and it's one of my favorites of uh, Zipporah Potter Atkins. And Zipporah Potter Atkins, um, she, I believe, um, she is the child that's listed here in Robert Keene's inventory. Um, she was born, um, and she was actually, uh, Robert Keene freed uh, the enslaved people he owned. And so she became free as, as part of this. And she becomes the first black woman to purchase property in Boston. Um, and so uh, here we have this this deed of I'm sorry from 1670 where she bought a uh, a home and you can just find her right in the Suffolk deeds, these published deeds from the 17th century. There she is, Zipporah Potter. Uh, and uh, there's been quite a bit of research into her and this is one of the reasons I, I wanted to end here um, because because of the nature of the records in New England, we can kind of reconstruct her life. Um, and in 2014, uh, there's a plaque laid uh, on the Greenway in Boston where her home would have been. Um, so we actually kind of know a little bit about her. And this is the, the plaque uh, laid in 2014 about her. Um, and so this is what the records allow us to do. They not only allow us to kind of you know, talk, kind of get us out of that exceptional mindset to think about New England in the context of, of, of a wider world of English colonization in the 17th century, the role of slavery in the colonization of New England, but also tell the story of the enslaved people that lived in the region, who they were, where they came from, what they did. And that is is one of the most rewarding parts of, of sort of studying uh, uh, slavery in New England for me is that we can uncover that, we can uncover the big story, all the context I gave you. We can also uh, uncover these individual lives and really narrate them uh, very well. So uh, I hope you have some questions. I see there's quite a bit going on in the chat. So I'm gonna stop my, uh, stop my uh, PowerPoint there. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, please put the question. I think we're going to do the chat was the idea, yeah. right, so, Sarah? And I've been, this is Roxanne again. I'm okay. st and still taking over for Sarah, who uh, was basically put back, coming back in and out of the okay. Zoom. Um, it's not as reliable, apparently, from Hawaii, where she happens to be <laughs> um, seeing relatives at the moment also. Um, so, yes, we've had a good chat going on. Thank you really a lot for this. Mm. I had no idea of a lot of this stuff, including <laughs> Providence Island was oh, yeah. <laughs> totally, who would have thunk it with that? So we've got both some broader questions and some sort of narrow ones, a little bit of questions on um, who sort of Samuel Sewell, his dates. Uh, I can see that Eve LaPlante, one of our advisors to mm. PHB answered that a little bit, but a bit on Samuel Sewell question. Um, and then the broader questions, let me um, go on to, uh, was there slavery in Britain just prior to the colonists settling in New England when they colonized New England in the early 1600s? Um, John Snyder, Josh Snyder, excuse me, asking that um, was um, asking because it seems like slavery began in the colonies uh, rather than being transferred from Britain to the colonies. So we have that yeah, question. So 
Yeah. So just to answer that question, um, there is slavery in in Britain. We have records going back um, into the 16th century of of the arrival of of enslaved Africans. Um, The thing is, it's not widely practiced. There's a few, you know, enslaved people. We saw showed the image of the the woman in the court of Charles II. It's not a large population, but there is a a small enslaved population that's that's in England, essentially from the moment that Europeans encounter Africa in the the 15th century, uh, they get involved in the slave trade. Um, and so we like so we know like Lisbon has a quite large uh, enslaved African population, and some end up in places like London as well, working in households, working in workshops, and things like that. It's not a large community, but there is some slavery in England. Simon Newman, um, who's retired from the University of Glasgow, I believe, um, he now lives in uh, Wisconsin. Um, he uh, has written quite extensively and has done quite a bit of work on sort of slavery in England itself. Yeah. Great. So I'm can gonna. I, can I add to that? This is Josh, the guy who asked the question. Oh, great! Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Aside from enslaved Africans or enslaved people from other continents in Britain during those really early decades of the 1600s, were other British people or Irish people or Scottish people or English people enslaved as as like proper slaves, not indentured servants. No. So the, the slavery died out after around the time of the Norman conquest in England. So there's no actual formal slavery in the in, in the British Isles. Uh, there's something called villainage, which you see is banned in Massachusetts in the 1641 law. It's it's like a, it's a form of serfdom that, that gets sort of close to it, but it's not slavery like it. So slavery, just to kind of the, the, the best way to kind of understand this is that slavery is the ownership of one's body. Uh, whereas mm-hmm. servitude is the ownership of one's time. And so yeah. the idea that, that you own someone's body and you own their progeny, like their children and for generations, that does not happen. That is uh, something that really does happen in the Americas um, and is applied exclusively to people of African and ind- indigenous descent. Yeah. Okay, Thank thanks. You very that, much. Very helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that distinction between the servitude and time, owning time in a person, versus owning one's body. I'm going to tell you a question that we're going to skip until the end, which is mm. what's your next book project? Okay. <laughs> That's a very nice ending one. Um, Ann Sobel asks, did any of the enslaved peoples fight back? Yes, you see, you see resistance. Um, in it's it's a little harder to see in the 17th century than in the 18th century, but there is it, it, there is resistance. Um, it's there's no slave rebellions or anything like that um in terms i'm talking about africans here um there are some cases of say murder of of an enslaver um so this is uh there's the horrible facts uh that you learn about new england um in in when you study slavery in the region and one of those facts is that uh we think about the popular conception of the Salem witch trials, right? The, the witches are burned at the stake, which did not happen, right? They're all hung. Um, but the there were people burn at the stake in early Massachusetts. There's two cases of it, and they both were enslaved women who murdered their enslaver. Um, one woman named uh, Marja or Mariah, depending on the the transcription of the document um, in the 1680s. Uh, you can see her in the, the Suffolk uh, court records from the, the Court of Assistance records. Um, that case, she's she's burned at the stake. Um, and then a, a woman named Phyllis uh, in the 1750s. Um, and, and in both cases, they're convicted of what's called pettit treason which means murder of one's master, um, which is considered, you know, worse than murder. It's it's treason. Um, and for that reason, it, it mets out a, a worse punishment. And the punishment is also gendered. So men are hung and put their bodies put on display. Uh, women are burned at the stake. And so the two instances we have of criminals being burned at the stake in Massachusetts are women who, enslaved women, African women who murdered their masters. The, there were concerns about, and in, 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 like I said, Margaret Newell can talk more about this, about indigenous captives and slaves resisting because they know the land better. They still have ties to their communities. Um, and there's real concerns, um, especially about the men. Um, so, for example, um, after King Philip's War, 
uh, when New England were New Englanders, they capture about at least 2000 um, indigenous people in New England. It's so many indigenous people that both the colony of Barbados and the colony of Jamaica ban the importation of indigenous New Englanders because they're afraid they're going to start a slave rebellion once they are because they're warriors. Right? A lot of them are men. They, they, they know how to fight and they're going to show up in, in a place like Barbados or Jamaica and going to start a, start a rebellion. Um, and so so they have, there's actually prohibitions on the trade uh, there, the, these laws that are passed in both colonies. Wow. So I'm going to then pivot the question somewhat to the Pequot Rebellion, and then we'll go back to several questions, especially about um, uh, Black women uh, enslaved people. Mm -hmm. um, questions on the Pequot Rebellion, um, sort of a more specific question and then a generic question also. Did enslavement and or indenture for indigenous peoples, did that continue into the 1700s? So that's not so much the Pequot Rebellion as mm -hmm. um, on indigenous slavery. And also the Pequot Rebellion timeframe, which I should remind myself of, what were the areas that were involved and roughly where in time and place did that uprising mm -hmm. happen? And indeed, as you pointed out, we'll be talking even more about mm -hmm. that the next one. Yeah, so the, the Pequot War is uh, 1636 to 1638, so it's two years, and it's pretty much the entire regions involved. Um, both, so the the English, all all the English colonies, Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, they're the Connecticut towns, they're involved, Rhode Island, um, as are the Native people, and as well. So the Native people ally with the English during the war. Um, the Pequot are not uh, well liked by other Native groups in the region. They've made contact. The Dutch, uh, they're well armed because of this. Um, so it, it's so that's yeah. You're you're learn more about that. So 1636 to 1638, and it's the entire region that becomes involved in that conflict. As for the like long term, um, so after King Philip's War in the 1670s, it is in theory banned. Like you're no longer allowed to enslave native people. What ends up happening though is is a is is two things. One is. For native people in the region, while they might not be formally enslaved, you begin to see other forms of bondage, unfreedom, kind of uh, being used against native people in the region. So uh, a lot of debt, like so debt. Uh, so they get like debt peonage. They end up in debt and debt servitude. Uh, there's a uh, uh, there's term, Margaret Newell uses called judicial slavery. Like if a, a native person commits a crime, they might be sentenced to 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 labor to work, um, and the court will sell them to someone to 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 do work. Um, that does not happen to to white criminals, right? It's it's a punishment exclusively for for native peoples um, and African uh, slaves as, as well. So so they continue. It's there. There's continuing unfreedom, but actual slavery among local native people does not happen. That said, um, New Englanders do become involved in trafficking natives from outside of New England into the region. So in the Carolinas in the 16th, late 17th, early 18th century, there's a large scale slave trade in, in native captives um, out, of, out of South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and many of them are sold to New England. And you see, uh, especially you see it in the early 18th century, if you read some of the earliest newspapers, you oftentimes see runaway ads for what are called Spanish Indians. Um, that's these are uh they were probably uh, native people who were on spanish missions in florida and they they're captured and then sold uh to new englanders to barbados to jamaica and, and places like that so while local native people are no longer uh enslaved in, in that way uh they do bring in uh enslaved native people from other parts of uh, of, of the americas fascinating no idea of any of that um also, Pamela Spar and others would love to know, hear more about why a freed Black woman uh, was able to buy property mm -hmm. when Pamela and many folks of us have thought that women were banned from owning property mm -hmm. in their own name until relatively recently. And uh, where's the other uh, question about women? Uh, I can't find that. So, but interest, interest mm -hmm. in, in uh, women who are enslaved also and freed Black women. Mm -hmm. So to, to answer that specific question, um, there's no prohibitions on property ownership uh, uh, for, for Black people. If they're free, they can buy property. Um, and this is one of the, the neat, it's kind of fascinating things about New England, because as I said, there, there's it's Massachusetts, what I know best, but the other colonies, is what, there's no like comprehensive slave codes uh, in the region. Um, and so that means there's all these sorts of 
gray areas that aren't covered by the law. So there's no, and so where, and where there's not law that creates kind of space for action uh, among free blacks. And so that's, that's what she does. She's able to buy property uh, because there's no law prohibiting it. Um, and that, so that's the, uh, the, the, it's really one of the remarkable things I found in writing the, the first book about slavery in, in Boston in the 18th century was just how well it's very clear enslaved people understood the law and how the law affected their day-to-day lives and what they could and could not do and this is a pretty good case that Zipporah Potter Atkins she knows what she probably knows the law well enough or at least has friends and and allies in the the white community who can kind of instruct her in the in the law uh to to find her way around that um as for enslaved women um as a whole um in the 17th century, it's it can be a little more difficult in the 18th century to see um, kind of demographic, like big demographic trends, because uh, uh, by 1700, there's only about an, a thousand or so enslaved people in in New England, um, Africans. Um, and so it can be kind of hard to see the demographic data. But but if it's uh, uh, anything like the 18th century, there are more men than women, probably about a 60, 40 split. Um, because as I, as I said, in New England, slavery is largely an urban phenomena. Um, and men are brought in to work in like workshops and do and you know be in work in the trades and things like that. Um, and so uh, th- there's a value on enslaved male labor in a way that there's not on on women's work. Um, but there do there are women you know working in households and 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 things like that. Uh, yeah, doing domestic. And labor. I spotted I've just spotted Lisa's question, which was a few down after Pequot questions. Mm-hmm. Um, how did enslaved women manage their children? How were the children cared mm. for? And if the enslaved woman became free, were her children freed as well? No to that last question. Um, they are still enslaved. They're owned by the enslaver. And so, in fact, one of the things you see oftentimes in the records is attempts of these women to buy their children out of slavery or negotiate a way, or maybe their husband might try to, you know, to, to negotiate that. So, no. Um, so, the way we actually have a couple good case studies of this from the early 18th century. Um, and what we know is that uh, on the one hand is that, so most enslaved couples in new England do not live in the same household. Uh, right. So the, the, the husband lives in a different, because slave holdings are fairly small in early new England, one or two to a household, uh, one or two on a farm or enslaved people on a farm. So this isn't Virginia where there's a plantation community um, or South Carolina or Barbados rather it's, it's fairly limited to a couple people per, per household. Um, so that means uh, fathers and, wa- and mothers live in separate households. And what this means is the the child will live with the mother and the, the mother and is the property of the mother's enslaver. Right. What we also know is that because of this relate this that the nature of that relationship is that New England fam and slave families tend to be a little more matro focused. Like the the mother seems to exercise uh, a little more power in the child rearing uh, relationship than than the father does, um, be, because of the nature of the uh, of of just the she's with the child all the time. Um, and, and, and it's like her, she kind of has a claim to the child. Of course, her enslaver has the claim to the child ultimately, uh, has a claim to a child. So, um, families, enslaved families in New England tended to be more, a little more matrifocal than either, uh, obviously English families, but, but even West African families, which were quite patri- patriarchal. Um, so that's a big change that this nature of the, the kind of housing or just the, the housing arrangement kind of dictates, um, in early New England, the, um, we also the other thing to keep is that um, a lot of enslaved. This is one of the, one of the heartbreaking things you encounter in the records um, is that a lot of enslavers did not see the value in a child, uh, especially an infant. It's another mouth to feed. Uh, which most New England enslavers are kind of middling people. They're craftsmen. They're uh, you know they're they're small time shopkeepers, innkeepers. Um, that's who makes up the bulk of slave owners in New England, um, and having a child an infant that's not productive is another mouth to feed and so there's this there's this tactic or 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 practice of giving away enslaved children to whoever will take the child and rear the child to to prevent another so this is a threat that looms so it's all of course in all of slavery there's always a threat that 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 children will be separated from their parents but this is like giving away an infant so at a very young age 
um, they will give away a child. Um, and you see, you see it in the newspaper, right? In the early 18th century, these ads start showing up in the newspaper that say, you know, uh, an infant, Negro infant to be given away. Yeah. So there, so there's, there is this kind of matrifocal focus on the, you know, in the family, uh, but there's a lot of instability within a family life, uh, these family lives. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for that horrible news. <laughs> um, Judy uh, Famiglietta Gletti um, asks, um, referencing a book by Lerone Bennett Jr. Before the Mayflower, mm -hmm. uh, Bennett wrote, that Africans who were brought to Virginia in 1619 were treated as indentured servants mm -hmm. and basically were thought of as working off their servitude, what we I now understand as their time, and then becoming landowners, office holders, et cetera. He also says that the concept of white and black races didn't exist at that time period, rather that uh, the class division resembled English social classes. Is Bennett's understanding here still regarded as accurate? No, this is this is one of the things that's been really con contended in the historiography and pushed back. Like, it, it would just be like the, the big thing is that it one of the problems in which the way that the histor history or the historiography of American slavery has been written is it's very focused on Virginia and Virginia alone and what happened in Virginia. And it's treated as this kind of very long-term process that plays out over about the course of a century from 1619 to about seven early 18th century or so and it treats virginia in the, as this isolate but virginians are not isolated they they're part of this wider connected world and the idea that people who sir who work for the virginia company lived in virginia guys like john rolfe did not understand slavery, didn't know what slavery was. John Rolfe was a privateer. He raided Spanish shipping. He visited Spanish colonies. He would have witnessed this, uh, right? So the idea that they they don't understand this, this institution that is at the center of, of this world that they live in, in the Spanish colonies and the Portuguese colonies, they hear stories about it, they read about it. Um, it's, it's actually really kind of selling short the people who lived in these colonies. It, it treats them as like that they don't know the world they live um uh they're not they're not educated about that the guys who sail around all the time I, it just it, it's just really uh there's that's that kind of older argument that they that how they absolutely understood who arrived um the fact that some of them did become free this is that is true um and we can track that through the records uh probably speaks more to the the nature of the labor arrangements than them not understanding slavery um, and, and perhaps opportunities to buy themselves out of slavery or, or something like that, um, rather than this kind of there's, oh, they're ignorant about slavery. And so this creates kind of opportunities. Uh, now, it's uh, those opportunities are probably found by enslaved people themselves to, to get themselves out of slavery, to become small farmer, far, like farmers and things like that. Um, and, and of course, by the mid mid century, by the 1650s, that that opportunity is gone. Yeah. Right. And that segues nicely into a question from Richard Bowles. Um, can you share about the types of labor that enslaved New Englanders did in Boston and other cities or in other sort of sizable towns? Everything would be the short answer. Um, you know, so that's it's a gender division of labor. So women tend to do domestic work. We know women, but also women did like the shopping for families and things like that. They went to the markets and, and you know, participated the, the economy in that way. Um, men did a little bit of, of everything. And, and one of the, the really remarkable things that's, that's always sort of astounded, once again, these things like I, I've studied this now for more than a decade. I'm still surprised when I think about it, um, is just how skilled enslaved men were in New England. Uh, they work in all the trades. Um, like I said, most enslavers in New England are are working people. They're they're artisans, uh, and so they tra they buy enslaved people, oftentimes boys, and and train them up. Um, so you have enslaved carpenters and coopers and blacksmiths, um, and so you see them. Uh, uh, whole industries by the early 18th century are heavily reliant upon uh, enslaved labor. It's uh, if you look at the way in which. Um, like different industries and the workers they're using, like distilling, for example, uses quite a bit of enslaved labor. Uh, shipbuilding does as well. Um, so everywhere you look, 
you see enslaved people either supplementarily or right at the, the center of, of a lot of these sort of industries. So pretty much any trade in, in New England, um, in, in households, you also in the rural areas as well, you see um, in farm labor of all sorts, um, a lot of uh, yeah, uh, cattle ranching, for example, in Southern Rhode Island, uh, enslaved labor, dairy. Um, there's, there is, uh, the one place where you have like large scale safe holdings emerge in New England is Southern Rhode Island in the 18th century. Um, and there's these massive dairy and cattle farms, horse ranches, cattle ranches, um, and, and slave women are like essentially making cheese and butter and all this at a huge scale to be sold to the, largely to the West Indies, but other places as well. So you see everywhere in the economy, uh, they are doing work. Um, and that was, that was the idea, right? And that from, from this early moment I talked about, that was the kind of idea was that the enslaved labor could be used to fulfill the labor needs of the colony, whatever that may be. Fascinating. And so I'm going to wrap up the questions, um, with one from actually a member of our board, Ed Breslin, um, who has, um, a more specific question which is um, that there's been no mention so far of the Royal African Society, which was the mm -hmm. Engl English Stuart Kings or the British Stuart Kings institution to promote slavery. Was the Royal African Society important in the development of slavery here in the um, New World? Uh, in, the, in the English Americas, absolutely. In New England, uh not so much. So one of the reasons um, that slavery is very developed so slowly, and there's such a like, like I said, we have to think about slavery is aspirational that people, if they have the opportunity, they will you purchase and use in slave labor, uh, it, it, whether in Virginia or New England. But one of the things that, that prevents that is that there's just not enough Con uh, concentration of wealth here uh, in the 17th century um, to afford shipping, say, a whole ship, a uh, whole cargo of captives. Um, and so it becomes, it's quite difficult to attract uh, a slave ship to New England. There's, I, I, I don't know how, how, how true this is, but there's a report from, um, I think it's Simon Bradstreet to the crown in the 1670s. And he says that a slave ship showed up a couple years ago and sold like 300 captives, 250, 300 captives. I don't know how much truth there is to it, like where that came from, but it's the only reference in the 17th century of the arrival of a slave ship to New England. Now, where the Royal African Company really mattered was to the Caribbean. Um, so one of the things, because it's a talk about New England, I, I didn't have a chance to get into it too much, but um, in the Caribbean, there's not really a desire to have enslaved populations reproduce themselves like there is in North America. Um, rather, they just work enslaved people to death. Um, and what allows, the, so the average lifespan of an of a enslaved person in the Caribbean is about five years. Um, uh, it, it's just horrific, brutal work that, that kills people, largely through exhaustion, um, but also exposure to diseases and poor diet and housing and, and things like that. Um, and what this means is a, is a constant sort of uh, need for new laborers to be brought. And that's the role of the Royal African Company is to ensure that sugar islands like Barbados and the Leeward Islands, Jamaica, have the, the captive labor force necessary. And it does a pretty good job of that in the, in the 17th century from, from the time it's chartered in 1660 till about uh, the 1690s or so. But even that can cannot meet the demand. Uh, there's also, it's a horribly corrupt organization from top to bottom. Um, and so it's it's actually kind of broken up uh, and, and it's liberalized and anyone then is allowed to participate in the slave trade uh, after the, uh, about 1693, I believe it's monopolies ended um, to better fulfill the, uh, the needs of the, the uh, of, of the slave of the sugar islands and then later virginia and south carolina jared what are you working on more that we can really look forward to because oh. it's fantastic <laughs> so where i work where my research is taking me now is i've i've become very interested in uh what's called absentee plantation ownership uh i found widespread ownership of plantations uh, uh, by New Englanders abroad. So New Englanders own plantations in uh, the West Indies, in Antigua, Barbados, uh, Jamaica, uh, Suriname, which is a Dutch colony, the, the Danish West Indies, which are today the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so I've become interested in this uh, 
this is kind of what I'm researching now is these fairly prosperous New England families that own plantations abroad and, and oftentimes hundreds of enslaved people who work those plantations and try to, to better understand this as a phenomena and, and its kind of impact on New England um, between about uh, between the late 17th century and about 1815 or so. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for just a fascinating fascinating talk um, yes, thank, and thank you all it's a wonderful turnout yeah. and wonderful questions so thank you all yeah really really brilliant turnout we really appreciate all of you <laughs>